All right, check this out. I'm here on my Kali Linux, and in my terminal, I'm listening on port 4443 for an incoming connection. Now, let's wait for a moment and see what happens. You see, we got a connection, right? Now, let me quit the connection and start the listener again. We'll need to wait for one minute, so I'll fast forward the video. And as you can see, we got a connection again. It doesn't matter how many times I quit the connection and restart the listener. I'll keep getting a connection every single minute. And that's exactly what we call persistence. By using persistence techniques, we can maintain access to the victim's computer. So even if we accidentally lose our connection, we can still reconnect to the system whenever we want. This is something that's actually used in real-world attacks and professional penetration testing. Today, we're going to learn three unique techniques for doing this. So let's not waste any more time and get started. But before that, if you're new here, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video, because we upload real hacking content here, not just random nonsense. Anyways, our first method involves cron jobs. So imagine cron jobs like having a little robot on your Linux system. You tell it to do something specific at a certain time every day. That thing could be anything. Cleaning up files, creating backups, or even running a backdoor script that executes automatically after a certain amount of time. And that's exactly what I did. The robot is called cron, and the instructions you give it are called cron jobs. Cron jobs are used to run tasks automatically at specific times or intervals. So, let's dive into this practically. On almost every Linux system, at least every one I've used, there's a file found in the slash etc. directory named crontab, which contains instructions for our cron jobs. In Kaylee Linux, you can just type crontab-e in the terminal, and it will open the crontab file for your user. But if you're on some other Linux distro, that might not work for you. In that case, you can open it manually using nano. Just type nano slash etc. slash crontab. That's the default path in most systems, but it could vary depending on your setup. Now in my crontab file, if you carefully look at the bottom, you'll see some random asterisks followed by a Python reverse shell command. It's just a normal reverse shell, nothing too fancy. I've already shown you how to get these in my earlier videos, but the actual magic lies in those asterisks. So what exactly is that pattern doing? In this case, it's set to run that reverse shell Python command every single minute, and that's how I was getting a reverse shell connection back every 60 seconds, no matter how many times I disconnected. That's exactly what a cron job does. You can also change the schedule however you like, and I'm going to show you how to customize cron jobs to fit your needs in just a bit. These cron jobs are present on almost every Linux system and run all the time. So what hackers usually do is place their reverse shell inside one and set a specific time, just like I did, to maintain access to the target system. Now I'm doing all of this on my own Kaylee Linux machine just to teach you how it works. You should never try this on anyone else's system without permission. It's illegal and unethical. To create crontabs easily, you can visit websites like Crontab Generator. I'll put a link in the description. From there, you can generate your own custom crontab line. For example, if you want your cron job to run every 30 minutes, you can simply select that option. You can also schedule it for a specific time of the day or a certain day of the month. Once you've set your schedule, you'll be able to add the command you want to run. In this case, it was a reverse shell command I generated using revshells.com. Just paste that command into the field, click on Generate Cron Tab Line, and it will give you a ready-to-use cron line. Copy it, paste it into your cron tab file, then close the file, and you're good to go. So now my cron job is going to run that Python reverse shell every minute. Let's start the listener and see what happens. You see? We got a reverse shell connection. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a Python reverse shell. You can use any kind of reverse shell. You could even craft a custom command that downloads a backdoor file from the internet and executes it, or runs a backdoor that's already present on the system. That's how powerful cron jobs can be when misused. The next method, which I personally really like, is using reverse shells inside shell configuration files. Now, if you don't know, whenever you open a terminal, it starts with some default configurations. These are defined inside configuration files. The exact file depends on which shell language your system is using. To check your shell, just type echo $0. 
This will tell you whether your shell is bash or zsh. If your shell is bash, then you need to edit the .bash rc file. And if it's zsh, you'll be editing the .zshrc file instead. So what hackers usually do is, once they gain access to the victim's system, they edit these configuration files, and right at the bottom, they add their reverse shell command, just like I'm doing here. Now let's save this file. Let me start my netcat listener and open a new terminal to see what happens. And boom, you see that? As soon as I opened a new terminal, I got a reverse shell connection. That's because whenever the victim opens their terminal, the shell loads the configuration file, which now contains our reverse shell command. So that command gets executed automatically, and we get the connection back. Another cool trick I love to do with these config files is editing aliases. With aliases, you can redefine normal Linux commands to include extra functionality. For example, check this out. We have an alias for the ls command. Now I can edit it like this, so that whenever someone types ls, it shows the expected output and secretly runs our reverse shell in the background. The victim will think they're just listing files, but in reality they're connecting back to the attacker. And that's why I say, Linux can sometimes be even more vulnerable than Windows. The third method is creating a system service. If you don't know what that is, basically whenever you start or boot up your Linux system, some background services start automatically. Things like the Bluetooth service, network manager, and more. These are essential for the proper functioning of a Linux system. But the cool part? We can actually create our own custom service. I've made a new service called backdoor.service. Let's take a look at its contents. This is the basic syntax used to create a systemed service. If you look at the service section, I've set it to run a script named script.sh, which is located in my home directory, whenever this service is started. Now let me show you the content of my script.sh file. Nothing too fancy here, just the same Python reverse shell command I've shown in earlier videos. Let's split up the terminal. I'll run the listener in one terminal, and I'll start the service in the other one. All right, the listener is running. Now watch what happens when I start the service from the second terminal. You see that? We instantly got a reverse shell connection. Now here's the thing. You can also enable the service so it runs automatically every time the system boots up. That's how persistence works through services. But that's also kind of a drawback, because it might get spotted more easily. So... I personally recommend sticking with the first two methods instead. There are a lot more persistence techniques too. For example, we can create a hidden user, modify kernel modules, and even more crazy stuff. But these three are some of the coolest and cleanest ones to get started with. Let me know if you want a video on more persistence methods. I'll definitely make one. So, that's all for this video. If you found it helpful, please hit the subscribe button and like this video. If we get 1,000 likes, I'll drop a full tutorial on different Linux privilege escalation methods. Also, drop a comment letting me know which persistence technique was your favorite. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, happy hacking.